Day number one of the Hearthstone Thailand Major. We're live here from Bangkok, Thailand at the Pan Tip Esport Arena. My name is TJ, and I am joined by D2. How you doing, man? You excited to, to be here in cast this event? Yeah, absolutely. Never been to Thailand before, so this is a pretty cool experience already. Haven't actually cast with you yet. I did a I lot know. of side panel analyzing yeah. at one of the championships, but uh, it's going to be exciting. Back in my sidebar days. <laughs> Don't miss those too much. But yeah, we have 128 players gathered here in the Pantip Esports Arena. They'll be competing throughout the weekend for a $5,000 prize pool, as well as the stakes of you know Southeast Asia Major. We had the Singapore Major a few months ago, um, and uh, it was uh, really exciting. We had a lot of players turn out. That was majority Singapore players. Now that we're in Thailand, it's majority Thailand players, but there are some big names throughout the tournament as well. There's the schedule for day number one. And uh, keep in mind, it is a rough schedule. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what match we're gonna be playing because of course we'll be going through the upper bracket. Uh, but that should be about eight matches today. Yeah, hopefully we get our top players moving through those upper brackets, or maybe some Thailand players making a surprise here. Obviously, we have a lot of Thailand players in this bracket, or Thai players, I should say. But yeah, hopefully we get some good matches in there, and you know, looking forward for a good one. I think tomorrow we have all the matches kind of like interspersed in there. Yeah, tomorrow, uh, of course, it'll be a two-day event. Uh, mm -hmm. Today we'll be have eight matches. Tomorrow we'll be playing through the upper bracket and all the way through to the championship. Uh, show it, it should be a fun weekend. There are some Hearthstone Championship Tour point implications for a couple players, right? But since there's no summer season, it's only for last call, right? And I, we can talk about that. So basically, what the last call is, if you guys aren't familiar with it, so players have obviously been qualifying for each championship, winter, spring, summer. But the last call, it's just whoever's accumulated the most points to be able to get that last call into BlizzCon, and you know people have been accumulating those points all year, which means unfortunately some people can't actually catch up to there, but the two that we have in this tournament are GCT Turth from India and Icho Liu Huan, I hope I'm saying that correctly, from Taiwan. Those are the two players. If they win the tournament, they come in second, they don't get enough points. Mm -hmm. If they win the tournament, they will be in last call, so look out for those two players. Yeah, GCT Turth, definitely a grinder, been around the scene for a long time, so uh, we'll see if he'll be able to uh, pull it out and um, make it to that last call, but it's going to be tough. Uh, but we have a, a really fantastic first match, and uh, I was actually really surprised. It was randomly generated right, brackets right. for 28 <laughs> players, and the first match is actually going to be Nelio versus Pimping Ho, two of probably the biggest names to come out of Southeast Asia. Both of these players have made it to BlizzCon, and there's only been three total players that are competing in this tournament that have made it to BlizzCon, with Kranich being uh, that third. So. Uh, pretty crazy to get that lineup randomly paired in the first first match of the day. Yeah, definitely. Not only getting to BlizzCon, I believe they both managed to advance to... Oh, wait, no. Nihio barely did not make mm, it because yeah. he lost to the hot form at the very end of yeah. Game 5. But they, we almost had an all-four A-pack into the round of eight. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. I... I was actually going to make that point, but then it just fell flat. Sorry about that, TJ. No, it was, uh, well, <laughs> Emilio was uh, probably one of the favorites going to that match, and Hopper right. actually ended up making it to the finals. Right, right. And, and he had a little bit of an underwhelming performance in the finals, but uh, who knows what Emilio would have been able to do if he was in that, that same exact position. Um, but it was, uh, it, he's definitely been a, a successful player. Pinpingo, uh, you know, Pinpingo is... He's a character. He's a character. <laughs> he is definitely a character, and his decks this time around sort of show his character, which is, uh, it's it's crazy to see what kind of decks he, he cooks up, but uh, he's had a lot of success this year being at the both winter and spring championships for Asia Pacific. Not having the best of performances at those tournaments, but just getting there is an accomplishment in, in, in itself. He did get to the top four of the winter championships. Mm -hmm. He locked out my, uh, knocked out my boy Monsoon in yeah. the, uh, the group stages there, but had a bit of a rough outing in the very next round, but just getting to BlizzCon and the next two championships, that's the best you can possibly do within the Blizzard championship. So yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, unfortunately, he won't be able to make it to last call since he didn't get enough points throughout the rest of the season. A lot of his points did come from mm -hmm. his two championships. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> because he actually like got some of the minimum amount of points to even qualify to be a part of the championships uh, in some of those seasons. Uh, but definitely a player to watch. Uh, Nelio has always, uh, you know, Pimpico has, has always been a player that's brought those eccentric, you know, Pimpico decks. He's always known for, you know, he said in his interviews at BlizzCon last year that he is the shaman itself. He yeah. loves shaman. <laughs> He's actually shaman, yeah. He loves to do crazy things with shaman. Nelio, on the other hand, he just likes to bring standard decks. He just likes to bring bring what's good. He plays on the American servers, and he, you know, makes Top 100 Legend quite often on the American servers, and you'll always see him just playing what he thinks is best. 
Right, absolutely. Always brings what he th thinks is going to win. Bit partial toward control decks, as mm. we saw at the Blizzard Championships. I believe he's bringing a uh, Cthulhu Warrior here, here as well. Is he's, that a, he's a Dragon Warrior this Dragon time Warrior, okay, yeah. sorry. If, I, maybe I'm getting mixed up Freeze with Freeze Mage, though. Freeze Mage, there you yeah, go. Yeah, okay. so definitely so, a little hint to control there. Yeah, definitely. And by the way, since we do have these players in our first match, we had a bit of a, 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 a draft we before did. we started. We did. You picked Neil number one. Mm -hmm. It was your first pick, and you were first pick first round to be able to, and you picked him to win this tournament. Yeah. And uh, we had a bit of a snake draft. I, uh, my second pick actually was Pink Ping Ho, mm -hmm. so a bit of a conflict of interest in the casters right now. <laughs> I advised against your Pink Ping Ho pick as well. <laughs> you didn't like the decks. Yeah, it's a, a disclaimer, everybody at home. Uh, Pink Ping Ho's decks are really weird. <laughs> um, and the, the, the deck lists have been uh, made available for uh, players as well. For players as well, so we can talk about them freely. Not, you know, not having to worry about giving the players uh, an advantage. Pippin is a very weird beast druid, and beast druid is a deck that a lot of players thought would be really good with Menagerie Warden being released, but he's got like Wild Walkers in the deck, which he, is the card that gives a beast plus three health at the four mana four four. He just likes to walk on the wild side, TJ. I, I guess so. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. And uh, I don't know, it just seems like it's a really weird deck. He has a Totem Shaman with Totemic Might and Primal Fusion, but he doesn't run the new card, Wicked Witch Shocker. Wicked, Wicked, yeah. Wicked Witch Shocker, yeah. So what's going on, D2? I don't even know. Yeah, I didn't get to, uh, obviously we had 128 players. I didn't get a chance to look at every single uh, player a second. We had a mm -hmm. bit of an internet outage right before our match started yeah. while we were trying to prepare. But um, yeah, so apparently, according to you, didn't have the best Totem Shaman. I actually kind of like, <laughs> I was looking at uh, Kranich's Shaman, and it was just, you know, cray I mean, because just all Totem Synergy. Just 100% Totem Synergy. I feel like if you're going to go with the Totem Shaman, you should go with 100% Totem Synergy. Right. Um, Pimping Hill felt like he needed, he built like an Agro Shaman core, and then he's like, you know what, let's just put some Totemic Mites and some Primal Fusions in this. He's got Flame Reef Faceless in there, and... How do you argue with Shaman himself, though? <sighs> you can't. You can't argue with Shaman himself, but in Spring Championship, he brought Shaman, and his Shaman deck was... It didn't perform. It was bizarre. It was a bizarre deck, and it didn't perform. Mm. So, uh, and Pimping Ho has sort of been a victim of his own creativity right. in the past with his decks. Pimping was a great player, but sometimes I feel like he's limited by the fact that he likes to do crazy things with his decks. Right, and there's almost pressure in a way, right? You, when you come into these tournaments, if he's just playing the standard shaman, they're like, "Ping Ping Ho, you're shaman. What are you doing playing standard? Yeah. What are you doing net decking? Right? You are the net deck. Yeah. So, <laughs> why, so you know, you can kind of feel the pressure for people who are making decks all the time. Sometimes they feel like they need to put up something new that maybe other people can copy. But um, yeah, it can backfire. I I actually uh, played Ping Ping Ho's shaman yesterday, and I lost three games in a row. And I saw him this morning. I, I've met Pimpingo many times, even all the way back at his first LAN in like 2014, which was like ESL Legendary Series. And um, he's always he, he always gives me like the funniest looks whenever he sees me. <laughs> like he's he's skeptical of me. And so I went up to him. I said, I, I played your Totem Shaman three times last night, and I lost all three games. He's like, no. I said, what's, what, what's up with that? And he looks at me and goes, you lost all three games? He said, he said, I don't think that's my deck's fault. <laughs> and I was like, OK, thanks, Pimpingo. Thanks well, you get what you ask for when you when you approach the shaman himself. Yeah, I, I should I should have known better. I should have known better. But yeah, uh, Nilio rounds off his lineup with uh, uh, a Malagos Druid. Yeah, and very strong these days. Yeah, uh, a lot of players have been taking Malagos Druid to very high legend ranks, and including Zixo and, and winning tournaments as well. Yeah, and we all know Frozen recently won uh, the One Nation of Gamers at Grand Finals with uh, a Malagos Shaman or sorry Malagos Druid. A <laughs> Malagos Shaman. That's Malago it. Shaman, it, the Zeus Shaman, you know, maybe someone brings it. We haven't looked at every single deck list. It's yeah. pretty difficult. Yeah. The, the thing about Shaman is if you put Tuskar Totemic, Totem Golem, and Tunnel Trog in a Shaman deck, and then anything else, it's probably going to be pretty good. Just throw an Ancestral Call in there, Malagos, and a bunch of spells, and you're, you'll be good. And and then you'll have the synergy with the... Say, I, remember, I wonder if everyone's tried to like buff a Tunnel Trog out of the range of Elemental Destruction. So that you could like just have a massive tunnel truck. You have to get like <laughs> pr primal fusion with a bunch of totems on the board. Yeah, and then you kill them. Sure. There you go. <laughs> While clearing their board. Bingo. You got it. Barnes might make that possible as well. Uh, but Neil, you know, uh, fourth deck is uh, mid range shaman. Uh, it's a uh, mid range shaman with spear claws. Right. So a lot of players were very apprehensive about. Mm -hmm whether or not they thought Spirit Claws was going to be good or not. Even in a lot of players' card reviews, they're like, 
I don't know. You know. <laughs> they, yeah, they, said, they kind of skirt around the fact that who knows? Like may, maybe Spirit Calls will be good. Nobody really knew, but a lot of players have been having success with it. At least on America's VLPS has been taking it to, to high ranks. Uh, uh, Loyan as well has been taking Spirit Calls to high ranks. A player from EU has made it made it to Spring Championships. What do you think of Spirit Calls, man? Is Spirit Calls the uh, the new thing. It's just interesting to think about because just having something like Blood Mage Downloads can make it extremely powerful. If you ever get a spell damage totem, that's nine damage mm -hmm. to face if you're playing a more aggressive deck. And you know, obviously, the, the part that you were talking about early, people need to play test it because, you know, how does it feel to roll one in four totems? I know it's like you know the actual percentages in your mind, but how does it feel going into games? And then, you know, sometimes you get the, the free wins off of just having that, all that damage because the Wrath of Air totem. It's kind of like when people started putting Wild Growth into it way back in early 2014. It's like, wait a second, I can just ramp into these, this combo. This feels great. I just kill my opponent. So kind of that same experimental phase for a while. It's kind of funny to think back to those days when, you know, it was considered innovative to put, play Wild Growth, Force of Nature, and Savage Roar in yeah. a Druid deck. It was innovative to put Force of Nature, Savage Roar in the beginning. People were like, Strivecore, you're a genius. Yeah. And when you put one in, and then, like, what if we put two in? <laughs> <laughs> what if we just, and we have two innervates. <laughs> and sometimes we can even just play it all. Yeah, I know. Just, and just kill double. our opponents. Wait, we can double combo. Yeah. We have innervates. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pimping Hill, uh, you know, big talking point there. I mentioned a little bit earlier, but the Beast Druid. Mm -hmm. There's so many good Druid decks right now that it's it's hard for a deck like Beast Druid, which just received some new tools with Menagerie Warden, to have a refined deck list. Like you can play Malagos Druid, you can play Token Druid. Right. Uh, you can just play sort of a rampy style Druid. And you know, there's a couple players that brought like Ramp Druid with Moonglade Portals. And so you basically like cut out the token-esque and you just ramp as hard as you can like and then with, keep your big threats alive. Just hope for Yasharaj off Barnes. <laughs> yeah, Yasharaj off Barnes into like Bog. Into Yasharaj. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, and But Pimpino is bringing the Beast Druid with some kind of inconsistent cards. You know, Wild Walker is not that great by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the Beast Druid cards just are very situational because they require beasts. And they're not like... Uh, Dragon Warrior, or not Dragon Warrior cards, but Dragon Synergy cards in general, where they're so overstatted mm -hmm. for their cost that it, it's worth playing them because, you know, the situational effect of it is outweighed by the fact that the card's just so good. But Beast Druid, it's, it's harder to get the huge effects off, like Menagerie Warden and, you know, Wild Walker. It's hard to make efficient trades with that, and you have to have a Beast Stick on the board. I don't know. I'm not sold on Beast Druid as a whole, and I'm definitely not sold on Pimping House Beast Druid. I think that Beast Druid is very strong. The issue that you kind of somewhat brought up there is the opportunity cost, right? Hmm. If you could bring Malagos Druid and then separately as well Beast Druid, it might be a pretty good situation for you. But since you have to not play one of the stronger decks in the meta right now, that makes it problematic. I do think that you can maybe make something happen with that Wild Walker, get some nice trades. Obviously, it doesn't really work with Mounted Raptor the greatest, but uh, you know, there's things in there. Mark of Yastaraz is actually, other than the Menagerie Warden, what makes the, the deck run. So if you get Mark of Yastaraz, get Wild, or yeah, the, the Wind Walker. Is that right? <laughs> Oh, is it Wild Wild Walker? I think Wild Walker. Sorry, I'm yeah. getting getting uh, the names of Hearthstone cards. You actually in my like head. made me question it for a yeah, second. Sorry. Like, wait, sorry wait a that. second. There's a yeah. There's there's the the Wind Speaker and Shaman. Anyway, mm -hmm, yeah. but um, yeah. So um, if you can get that off, you can get some crazy value trades and really snowball the game. I think there's there's a lot of um, you know consistency with it since you don't really need the ramp. You can just go one, two, three, four, five, and so in that case, maybe the potential of the deck as something that can go off is a little bit lower. But I think the consistency is there, so you're kind of trading power for consistency a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so as an aside, uh, just to keep you guys updated, we're just waiting on the players to confirm their bans before we jump into the first match of the day. Uh, so just going over, you know, just some talking points for throughout the day, uh, some decks to look out for. Uh, Southeast Asia uh, is actually pretty eccentric with their deck choices overall. Uh, a lot of these players tend to be more willing to take risks mm. than in other regions, uh, especially if you look at like Americas, where Americas is like a region where a lot of the decks are homogenized. People right. will, you look at the championships throughout the Americas region throughout the year, it's, the decks have been very, very similar, maybe with a couple exceptions for players. Um, even Europe, you know, Europe tends to latch on to decks and, you know, not let them go. And Southeast Asia is a lot different. They're very uh, eager to innovate. They're very eager to try new things. They sort of take inspiration from all the other regions instead of trying to have their own, um, which is really interesting. 
Right, it's interesting to think about like the strategy for winning a tournament overall, right? Because there's 128 players. I don't know if we went over this, but the prize pool is $5,000, right? And you don't get anything until you get to the top eight. So top eight are busts, essentially. You don't get money, don't get points. And, you know, there's an interesting dynamic between whether you go for just the standard decks and try to, you know, roll high with those, especially if you don't aren't as confident in yourself and beating the top players, you know, like Cranich or Ping Ping or what have you. Or do you just go for the decks that, can, that are really specialized toward rolling high and just try to go for the most crazy combos possible? And if you do get that, you're probably going to be able to beat even a player who you think is a bit more, you know, experienced than you. Yeah, and maybe that involves the Oxeron. Maybe it involves <laughs> maybe it playing does. Beast Druid and just trying to innovate out crazy Menagerie Warden combos. Um, but uh, going through the list, I guess, while we wait for uh, these players to get into their game, uh, Pippi goes third deck is sort of like a hybrid hunter. Uh, it's it's pretty much a list that a lot of players have, like, stu s sort of stumbled upon, I guess. I don't know. It, it, it's You call it hybrid hunter, but it could be mid-range hunter-ish. Uh, kind of grandmother, you know, you run a lot more uh, one drops, so you mm -hmm. make the more consistent early game to get through it, but still runs high main, still runs Call of the Wild, still runs the Infested Wolf. So uh, this is a deck that's sort of like a fringe case for a lot of players. They want to bring Hunter. If it was best of seven, they'd probably bring Hunter. But it's one of those decks that floats on, on, on the edge of the, sort of those best decks. But Pimpico is bringing it as one of his main four. Uh, what, what has sort of been your experience with watching Hunter sort of evolve over the past, you know, couple weeks with, with Karazhan being released. Do you think it has a place in the top Conquest lineups? I think it does, but only when you're, when you can really scout your opponent out, mm -hmm. right? And we saw that, like, you can you just casted the Onog tournament, yep. and it was a situation where if you knew who was going to be in the tournament, knew the, what kind of decks they would like to play, then you can then go ahead and pick Hunter if you think that's going to be able to counter what they brought as well. I'm a little bit more skeptical about bringing into a field this large because there's consistency issues, obviously. And it's, and a lot of these players are pretty new to the land situation, especially the Thailand players who have come out. We've seen some pretty crazy decks, but mm -hmm. you know, you kind of expect things more, a lot more zoo, for instance, from some of the the players new to land, and then mm -hmm. that might uh, that might really trip up the hunter. Yeah, and because Frozen realized that the field in the tournament that he won with Hunter just last week would probably not have many Zoo Warlocks. Right. And, if, and if it did, uh, you know, he realized that he could make up for it with his other decks and that he was, it was pretty much, it was very weak to, to the rest of his decks. Hunter also has become a lot closer to Zoo Warlock mm -hmm. and the way Zoo Warlock is going nowadays is much less of sort of a, it's much more of an all-in strategy, especially with Discard Warlock. Right. A lot of the Zoo Warlocks yeah. that you see today are like, Really heavy discard warlocks with Dark Shard Librarian, with Silverware Golem, Double Soul Fire, Double yeah, Doom yeah. Guard. Uh, really like all in style decks. And Hunter can do okay against that because they can just use all of their removal early and just try and get to Call of the Wild. And if they get to Call of the Wild, a lot of times they can just win. So, um, but yeah, like he knew a lot of players were going to be control decks as well. So he could, you know, scout it out. It'll be interesting to see how Hunter performs. Uh, Hunter, Hunter, Mage, and Warlock are all around the same amount of people brought them. They're all right. around sort of like that 60-ish players out of the 128. Um, and you actually have some pretty detailed statistics on some of the decks here. Yeah, this is actually before three players dropped out, and or four players dropped out, mm -hmm. excuse me, and three players got in. We can actually talk about that for just one moment. What if, I was actually saying before that the two players could have made it in. There's actually a possibility, since we don't know who those players are, they're about a mystery right now, that it could be one of the players that could maybe make it to the last call, but that would be somewhat likely. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, these yeah. are a bit off because we have three player, four players out and three players in, but at the time, it was 102 Warriors, 99 Shamans, 88 Druids, 63 Hunters, 57 Mages, 50 Warlocks, 27 Rogues, 17 Paladins, and 9 Lonely Priests. But uh, Single digit Priests. <laughs> yeah. It's more than zero. More than zero. So Dragon Priest is I actually expected. doing pretty well. I mean, reasonably well, like, at least compared to the Resurrect Priests or, you know, pre- yeah, uh, Karazhan Priest. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, but one of the priests that we saw, we were looking at the deck list earlier, is like a classic priest. It's like if you Googled a Maz DreamHack 2014 <laughs> priest deck, this is what would come up. He's right. got like Sengid Shield Masters and, and literally no new cards beyond... I don't even know what the most... They, they might just be all classic cards because he runs Rag, Ysera, Mind Control... It just might be his first land. You never know. It, so. it could be. Or he was just making a next level read. <laughs> and he's like, who needs Onyx Bishops 
When you can just take their feast cards. of the feast. Yeah, when I can just slam Ysera on nine. And then mind control their cards. And mind control their cards and start Ysera's Awaken some fools. You know what I want to watch, actually? I forgot who brought this deck, but I really want to watch the player who brought a Fatigue Warrior. He brought Prince Malkazar with Devil Cold Light Oracle Mountain Giant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what I want to see. That's sick. So, <laughs> there's actually been a couple players who have... Oh, was that Pimp? I think that was... That was Pimping Ho's Warrior. I, I think it was Pimping Ho. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Is that the is he the one who brought? No, he's not. Okay, he's not. He's not. He's not. <laughs> Forget that. Fight. I remembered it. I remember how the deck lists were submitted, and it wasn't how Pimpix was, but it was uh, uh, Varian Rin. Oh right, with right, Prince right. Prince Malkazir. He is not Axel, I think. Oh yeah, he is not Axel. That's right. He is not Axel. Uh, one of the participants of the Asia Pacific Spring Championship. Um, he and also the 2015 APAC Championships, I believe. 2015 Asia Pacific Championships. Right, to go to BlizzCon because yeah, yeah. they didn't have seasonal championships last yeah. year. Um, yeah, and so he brought a deck with Prince Malkazar right. and Varian Rin. And, and basically the deck is like all spells. Right. Besides Jessicar, Sylvanas, Prince Malkazar, and like Acolytes of Pains, and then Varian Rin. So basically his plan is to stall out the game and then Varian Rin into his Prince Malkazar legendaries. Right, just all legendaries coming out. And then it's yeah. going to be just Lorewalker, Nat Pagel. Nat Pagel. <laughs> Milhouse, Mana Storm, and, and Shifter's Eris. And a Shifter's Eris. Yeah, exactly. The dream. And then he concedes. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's also just a card there, which you want to have the battle card. I guess you don't play very until you get your just a card out. Yeah. yeah. It's basically just remove a warrior. Feels very good. I, with all those spells, though, did, I'm, I'm very sad that the Yug just wasn't thrown in. Yeah. It's, I was, we were talking about it yesterday. Pretty much any deck that runs like eight or more spells. Just throw Arcane Giants and Yogg. Just throw, <laughs> maybe not Arcane Giants, but Yogg, yes. Yeah. If you run like 10 or more spells, then yes, Arcane Giants. I mean, yeah. it's only three slots in your deck. Yeah, pretty and, easy. And if you play 10 spells and you can, if you, even if you just play eight and you can play Arcane Giants for four, it's still great. Feels it's great. a four mana 8-8. Eight, eight. Yeah. It's like the, old handlock days. The worst feeling is when you actually just play them for like an eight mana 8-8 eight, eight, and it just feels so normal. Just not not OP at all. It just feels so just good. This is standard. <laughs> yeah. It still feels good, but just not as good as it could have. Yeah. It just feels like missed potential. We're still waiting for uh, the match to start, by the way, so I'm gonna continue a bit of talks though. Mm hmm Is your first time in Thailand? It's my first time in Thailand. Yes it is. I guess a lot of Southeast Asian events, but We had a, we went to an authentic Thai restaurant last night. We did. Decent. It was good. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of I'm not a big fan of spice, but yeah, I don't yeah. know if I, I would it was, it was, get along. It was here. enjoyable at the time, but uh, this morning was a bit, <laughs> <laughs> was a bit iffy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, well, one end agreed with it, the other end did not. Yeah, unfortunately. But um, yeah, Thai, Thai is known for their their spicy food. Mm -hmm. Sure, and it can be very delicious, very spicy as well. Yeah, I was uh, I cast Singapore Major a few months ago, and it was really cool. The, what the player the players do here is they basically stay in sort of uh, I, I, it's a hostel, like one big right. one big place that they all stay in, and so it's basically just like one big think tank sort of of Hearthstone. Mm. You know, you have little sub communities like yeah, each one of the countries. You know, they stick with each other. There's, mm -hmm. Sometimes there's language barriers. Um, and other times, you know, they're just like differences in cultures and play styles. But it's kind of cool to see them all come together. And uh, uh, especially like the, the host country players. Uh, yeah, when they come out. Because when they have a major in your home country, you yeah. can't come out. You can't not come out, I mean. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, it, it's cool to see. It was cool to see a lot of the Singaporean players, the Singapore major. And now it's cool to see, you know, the majority of Thai players just coming here and trying to... Uh, prove themselves, and you know that's what it's that's what it's all about. And I, I, the atmosphere is really cool. All the players are here on site. Right. Um, uh, that's you know why we're having a little bit of delays during the first match is because we're trying to organize. Yeah, get everyone in the 128 venue. players at once, all playing. You Pretty know, cool venue, by the way. Right over here. Yeah. Um, we have we have disco lights and like a disco ball. It's very it's things. very Kerasan team. Yeah. Can you name all the countries, by the way? Just putting on the spot. I, I, I don't think I can. I have a list oh, you have a right list. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thailand, South Korea, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Japan, and Taiwan. Yep. The and only country that there's two Indian players as well. Yeah, yeah. The only the only country that didn't uh, isn't in this tournament. That's kind of like the Southeast Asia region is Macau. So Macau, yeah. 
Oh yeah, in India's there as well. It's just not shown on the on my little list here. Yeah, that was cheating though. You're supposed to think of it off the top of your head. Yeah. Sad. I probably could have actually. Yeah, I don't think I could. <laughs> I practiced it. I definitely the, practiced the flags it. are actually. I need to go do some more studying because we're gonna have flags when we see the bracket later, and um, hopefully we can name those off yeah. the top of our head. Uh, it is a giant double elimination bracket. Right. Uh, I think through the first day we're gonna play mostly through the upper bracket to try and follow some of the stories of the players that are gonna make th make their way to the upper bracket. It's also more likely that we see them on day two, right. since if they make their way through the upper bracket on day one. Yeah, who is this guy on day two? <laughs> yeah, they'll have double their chance on day two to actually make it to the round to the round of eight and onwards. So uh, if you uh, watched any of the preliminaries for the other region, uh, it's a very similar structure to that. Mm -hmm. uh, roughly 128 players. You know, I know preliminaries is like 150, and a lot of players get yeah. buys in that first round. Yeah, so whoever, it's a longer. yeah, in that situation, it's whoever was a, the all the ties for 128 get in because they don't want to have any weird tiebreakers. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, there might be some players that are going to have tougher roads than others. Uh, players like that, these two players right like, here. Like these two players, like Neilio and Pimpico in their first, first matchup. Round, yeah. For, that's a tough match to go in your first round. So one of these players is going to have a really tough road because falling to the, lo to the lower bracket in a big event like this means that you have to win like eight matches in a row to get to that top eight. Yeah. And, you and also like 10 in a row. And the one thing is that you're playing against unknown players and known players, and you have no idea. Obviously, you can kind of see their, their deck list, but you don't know their style. You don't know you know how they're going to come at you. You don't know what they're going to ban, for instance. So it's yeah. very difficult to get through a slew of completely different players. Yeah. And uh, so we should be getting into match number one pretty shortly here uh, between Niglio and Pippi Hill. Uh, but as you mentioned earlier, uh, both these players have do have a lot of LAN experience and they're both right. competing at uh, multiple regional championships for each of, each of them, uh, multiple regional qualifiers for, for each of these players, uh, a BlizzCon appearance for both of them, as well as many, many uh, Open Tournament Cup finishes and Top 100 ladder finishes, whether it be on the Asia servers, which is mostly where Pippi Hill plays, or on the America servers, which is mostly where Nelio plays. And I think most of the Southeast Asian players uh, maybe with the exception of like Taiwan and Korea play right. on the America servers. I know a lot of Singaporean players, Thai players, yeah, I'll show you New Zealand players, typically, Filipino players. Yeah, the Asia server is typically uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, some Thai players, I think, go back and forth on right. which servers they play in, but uh, you can definitely tell by their deck list and what decks they're bringing, what servers they tend to play on. Yeah, there's a little bit of difference. So. Yeah, uh, especially if you look at decks like uh, Tempo Mage oh, and right. Dragon Warrior. Those Ooh. decks differ a lot between the tournaments. All right, well, here we go. The first game of the first match of the Thailand Hearthstone Major, Pimpy Hill versus Nelio. It's going to be the Totem Shaman versus the Freeze Mage from Nelio. And keep in mind, we mentioned this earlier, but these players do know that the decks that are playing in, so they can mulligan with perfect certainty what they're playing against. And yeah, Ping Pingo decides to keep that Totem Golem in his opening hand. Obviously, it makes sense. Very difficult for the Freeze Mage to get rid of that, barring using tools like the Doomsayer, even though he does have a Camellio, Crossover, and Doomsayer in hand already. Yeah. It's kind of funny that if Nelio decides to play Trinity Doomsayer here, Oh no, Pippigo won't have a way to deal with it since it'll be overloaded. Thunder Totem wouldn't be able to answer it. Thunder Totem Primal Fusion would if he had three mana. Right, they for exactly seven damage. Yeah, but this is going to be really the only turn they are able to get a safe Doomsayer loan off. The question is is whether or not Neil feels like he can save a Cross Nova. But turn two Doomsayer, especially rolling into card draw, is so powerful against faster. Well, Pippigo's deck isn't really that fast, but it's really good against Shaman and two decks that like to get on the board early. Right, and that's a really big thing that you bring up is that there's so many factors into this turn two Doomsayer, right? There's you try to think, do I want to wait for the Frost of a Doomsayer? Number one, you're taking a lot of damage. Number two, you're not really doing much other than playing a novice engineer. And also on top of that, you actually have a follow-up. You see a lot of times people clear the board and it's like, well, what's your follow-up? Okay, you know, for instance, for Paladin, they go Pyromancer equality, and the next turn they just go with the hero power. It's like, well, well, you didn't gain any actual initiative, but here in the case of Nelio, he, he has the exact play that he wants for turn three. Yeah. And just deciding what he wants to do. Maybe he wants to guarantee that draw on turn five, but yeah, this is a bit too yeah. juicy to play on curve. 
I think, yeah, Acolyte of Pain, you force your opponent to have almost exactly Rock Fighter or Lightning Bolt in that situation, or to roll Spell Power in the case of Spirit Claws. I think Pipping is going to try for the Spell Power first and doesn't get it. But maybe Thanos. But if you get one card from Acolyte, a lot of times it's, you know, pretty good if you buy damage from your opponent because there's a lot of cards on this deck nowadays. You run Loot Orders, you run Novice Engineers, you run uh, Arcanine you like Acolyte to like Pain. So the Bad Scientist is gone, you have a lot of more room for Cycle. So you can afford to destroy your Acolyte of Pain. Risk it only on one card, it's still pretty good. Yeah, definitely. All right, so coming back for Neil's side, pretty easy play there. Just go ahead and play your Novice Engineer, ping off the Thanos, because obviously that's a lot of damage to your face if you leave that unchecked. And, well, right on time, Flaming Faces, the meme the himself, 4 mana 7 7 coming onto the field. I'm gonna go ahead and pressure Neil as much as possible, and Neil has kind of an answer, but it's pretty difficult. Yeah, he's got Frost Nova Doomsayer, but that is his second Doomsayer, and it's not that big of a board. Right, he can also Fireball Coin ping, but then you're using your coin. He can also just kind of go on the you know, perpetual freezing plan, but the perpetual freezing plan doesn't really work unless you have, you know, something to do three turns from now after I that's all said and done. Mm -hmm. Another option would be to coin Blizzard, but that seems like the worst out of all the options. Right, yeah, was, that's what I was mentioning with the, you know, freezing the entire time. Yeah. Just coin Blizzard, then you're committed to Frost Nova, so looks like Neo is gonna do this. The nice thing about, you know, going for the Frost Nova Doomster is that Either you clear the board, or they go, they you know jump through hoops to deal with the doomsday, which is a big deal. Yeah. Then there's no development, and you know you're you're obviously healing for seven essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. So speaking of dealing with it, can he deal with it? No. Uh, even if he rolls spell power, uh, the, he won't be able to. He right. won't be able to maelstrom portal and rock better weapon because of the overload. So, like this tap at 15 Hell, he's not going to really be able to do anything else besides just re spirit claw. So, no, but that's a lot of momentum loss. And Nelio's able to hold on to coin, which means he'll be able to coin Alex Raza. And even though it takes a couple turns, he's already got enough burn in his hand to deal with that 15 health. Yeah, and Which, so that's a pretty good spot for Nelia right yeah, now. Yeah, speaking of burn, Pink Ming Ho is obviously playing more of a totem arranged shaman, so he's not going to be able to burn out Nelio here, which means that Nelio is looking to be in a ridiculously good spot right now. Yeah. So, Pink Ming Ho, I talked about his totem shaman deck and how I didn't really like it because it sort of lacked a general game plan. He runs Primal Fusion, he runs Totemic Might, but doesn't run sort of a secondary win condition, and by that I mean like Doomhammer or Bloodlust right. to get value out of his totems that he buffed up. Mm -hmm. He doesn't run Wicked Witch Doctor <laughs> either, so, oh, that's really wow. good. You oh, saw oh, Neo -Yo oh. just, you know, shaking his head up and down. He's like, yep, that's the exact card I wanted at this point, yeah. and that might just seal out the game, getting that Thoris in there. Yeah, now he'll be able to Alshaz the next turn and then be able to deal 15 damage in one turn, which he wouldn't have been able to do before without the Emperor Thorstein reduction. So Pimping has to find a way to pop the block. Oh, this is Barrier, actually. Yeah, it's Barrier. Oh, oh well, he needs to find a way to actually kill them right, over the next right. two turns, which, I mean, might be possible if he draws Wait. perfectly, but he doesn't have any burst cards in his deck is the thing. He doesn't have Doomhammer. He doesn't have Bloodlust. And the thing for Neilio here is that he can actually just go Alex Straza into Coin Frost Bolt so that there's no... You're, you're taking away three damage from Pink Pink Ho as well. And even the Thorson can go ahead and start doing cleanup duty. Yeah, but this is where your Pink Ho... Or sorry, your Neilio and you're thinking... Alright, let's, uh, let's start thinking about the next game because I already have this one in the bag <laughs> at oh. the moment. Well, Pipico's going to make a push. Right, he's going to do his best to go ahead and clear up this Thoros, and that means he's not getting much damage to his face, though. We're going to see 8 go to the face here after the cleanup of the Thoros, which means that he's going to erase the block, but that means, or excuse me, the barrier, but that uh, Neilio is still going to be at 24, which is obviously not a place that Pimping Ho wants his opponent to be at. You can see Neilio smiling. Oh, how cute. <laughs> Totem's attacking me. 5 7 healing Totem. And Nigo says, you know what, I have a giant dragon, and you don't have Bloodlust, so we're going to go ahead and finish out this game. I would be very surprised if he didn't commit to the Coin Frostbolt. He, he's just going to try and think through I exactly how much damage right. he needs to play around, because these players know the deck list. So Nilio can think in his head, how much di is the most possible damage that Pimping Ho can deal to me next turn? 
And Pipigo just doesn't have burst cards. The highest possible damage he could play next turn would be Thunderbolt Valiant into Totem Up. That would be the most damage he could get. That would only be a net gain of six. Yep. And Ping Ping Ho is going to be 13 damage off lethal, if my if my math is correct here. And yeah. uh, you don't really want to be 13 damage off lethal. No, you kind of want to have lethal. Exactly. And oh, that's this is true. He actually has to go ahead and clear Alex Strauss. Yeah. <laughs> and the last turn, he had to clear Emperor Thor's hand. So he had to find a way to win over two turns while also dealing with the big threats that Nelio was playing. You know, this isn't how Freeze Mage always performs. Nelio had both Doomsayers and Freeze effects in his early hand, as well as Emperor Thor's hand on six, Alex Jaws on seven. And Burn after that. And Burn on eight. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a pretty... Feels like a standard game of Freeze Mage, but Pippi Cone never really had a chance from the get-go. Nelio takes game one. Yeah. That said, though, I think that Freeze Mage is a pretty heavy favorite in that matchup because of the lack of burn in Ping Ping Ho's deck. Really, oh, yeah. when people talk about you know the matchup being close, initially it was Shaman was favored, and recently we, you know you saw the best of 21 between mm -hmm. Laughing and RDU, for instance, kind of making it look like it's a bit more close to 50-50, but that's assuming that Doomhammer's there because you can't consistently freeze the face. Without that, it's pretty heavily Freeze Mage favored, I would say. There was a lot of controversy about that match, though. <laughs> Because there, I talked to a lot of players that disagreed with RDU's general mulligan strategy, even right. after like 10 games uh, mm -hmm. in Aggro Shaman. He mulliganed like it was a normal Aggro Shaman game instead of an Aggro Shaman versus Freeze Mage game. Um, so uh, I guess in a, like a ladder setting or conquest setting, well, no, in a ladder setting, I guess, not a conquest setting, where you don't know your opponent's deck list and you have to mulligan for tempo, mm -hmm. then, yeah, Freeze Mage is probably favored, but it's, uh, it's tough. But Pimping O's list is... It's not definitely unfavored. Yeah, it's not like, going it's, to be Freeze Mage. <laughs> it is probably never going to be Freeze Mage. Neelia could probably let Pimpingo have a full board. Right, and just freeze it. And, and just <laughs> still, like, not even just, like, take the hits. Because it's probably right. going to be a board full of totems and maybe an Ardent Squire and a Totem Golem. And so you're taking, like, a four each turn. Mm -hmm. You could probably just race them yeah, at it's that like, stage. It's like the strategy of letting the zoo have an entire board full of tentacles and just, you know what? You, you can't kill me, so I'm yeah. just going to let you have that. You're just dealing seven every turn, and you're not going to get any more unless you have power overwhelming. So, um, but, uh, so, uh, Nilio has Freeze Mage out of the way. Um, I, we didn't quite see the bands. Right. Uh, we, but I imagine it's Warrior Band for Nilio. And Warrior Band is maybe. And <laughs> probably Warrior Band for Pimping Hill, but there might be a Druid Band based off of his decks. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard to say. Nelio does have mid-range Shaman, so I think Pimping Ho would feel confident in the mirror matchup. He'd feel confident playing against mid-Shaman. So it's between Warrior and Druid. Um, I guess we'll just see when the <laughs> what matches we have uh, next. But now that Nelio has Freeze Mage out of the way, if Druid is banned, then he's got the Dragon Warrior plus the mid-range Shaman left for himself. Right. And uh, that's a pretty good situation to be in for Nelio. Pretty strong decks remaining over. But um, yeah, apologies for not having the bands in and kind of mm -hmm. starting a little bit late. Obviously, you know, organizing entire tournament. I believe we actually had a Thai kind of speech at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And that was part of it as well. And we're getting our, our, all our players situated. So we saw the trophy as well. It's like a, oh. it's a Hearthstone Arena key. It's pretty cool. It's oh, pretty right, right. Trophy. They actually do that in China. They have... Uh, yeah. So when they, when they go to BlizzCon, they have the the twelve win key. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a pretty cool trophy. I wish I had a trophy. Oh, uh, I never have. actually got a trophy for winning uh, one of the online tournaments, but uh, I got. So when I qualified for BlizzCon a couple of years ago, they gave me like a little like plaque type thing. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. I have a cardboard BlizzCon poster that somebody gave me. Oh, I well I, I won one of those, but <laughs> I didn't. Even. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, you haven't had you haven't had to deal with the pain of not drawing fire works and losing the fire bet for thirty five thousand dollars. So, no, you're right. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's something that not many people have experienced in their life. <laughs> yeah, true. I feel like maybe two. <laughs> yeah. Probably one. Probably. And it's just you. Yeah. Well, for time, well specifically fire bet, yeah. But there's other people who've lost in. Uh, in you know really high pressure matches, mm. like for instance, uh, Kano got a bit unfortunate when he played against yeah. Hot Form at the same stage of BlizzCon. I'm actually going to challenge Firebat right now to a thirty-five thousand dollar <laughs> best of tournament. Do I draw fireworks? Dragon War Mirrors. <laughs> uh, so he's like, sure, <laughs> let's do yeah. this. 
I've heard Firebat will never back down from a money match. Mm. The bat. The bat. He is really, for his age, I think he's still 19 or 20, he's really got his financial future already set. But enough about Firebat, we're going to the next game, and it is going to be the Shaman once again here. <laughs> Sorry. Look at that hand! <laughs> Double totemic mic. Get those Top. 06 tons out there. Yeah. Toss those suckers away as fast as you can. All right, Thrall versus uh, Garros this time. Job's done. And the Dragon Warrior does pretty well against, you know, the Aggro Shaman. But uh, what are your thoughts on this particular matchup? Uh, Midrid Shaman, I feel like, is a lot closer. Um, Dragon Shaman can usually just curve out, especially against Totem Shaman, because... Dragon one Warrior. reason why, yeah, the one reason but why midrange, why, why aggro shaman, uh, why midrange, or sorry, oh my gosh, why midrange shaman I think does a little bit better against dragon warriors because they curve out longer into the game, like they they never have weak plays. Even if you go into turn six, turn seven, mm -hmm. uh, they usually like provide multiple threats throughout the course of the game, whereas aggro shaman doesn't. You know, yeah. after a while, the dragon warrior is dropping a big threat and the aggro shaman isn't. Exactly. Um, but this deck has a lot of situational cards. It's got Spear Claws, it has uh, Totemic Might, it has Primal Fusion, and against the deck that relies a lot on the board, not being able to hold a board, Would and have situational cards that relies on you having a very specific board, i.e. Totems, I feel like it's a little bit inconsistent. But Pimino does have a good opening hand. I mean, he's got Coin, Totem Golem into Art Squire. Yep, that is the kind of the dream there, going Coin, Totem Golem into any sort of one drop to continue the pressure. He is going to do a bit, little bit of bluffing here. Pretend he has something like Slam, potentially. Pretend he has some sort of card that he's maybe not going to elect to play, but we can see that. Oh, none of those cards are green. Going to go ahead and armor pass. No, he was one of those players that sometimes likes to play a little bit of mind games with his opponent. At BlizzCon, he actually decided to rope every single turn sometimes and wait until the rope came out to, maybe, to make his play. Like, he wasn't even thinking about his play, so... Sometimes they can get on the opponent's nerves. Sometimes they can get on the audience's nerves as well, though. Yeah, he had a lot of people that were kind of upset about him for that. But, hey, if I'm playing it in a tournament to play for top eight at BlizzCon, I am definitely going to use every single piece of uh, advantage that I can take in a game like that. And if he thinks his opponent's going to tilt because he's roping every turn, he's going to rope every turn. And so... Uh, yeah, like you said, uh, he likes to do a lot of card tricks as well. Uh, Neilio is also a very good uh, hand reader. Yep. Um, he reminds me of sort of, of players like uh, Chucky and RDU, who both uh, have can make sick hand reads off of basically zero information. And Neilio well, likes some to do that as well. Well, so, uh, well yeah, but it has to be some information. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm saying it se seemingly zero information. Yeah, yeah, seemingly zero information. They'll make card reads. Just because of how many how many times they they play in tournaments and on ladder and they just practice right. trying just, to read cards. Just feel on how the game's progressed so far. Yeah. And for Pingy Mingo, so for Nilio, he had to decide whether or not to go for maybe a Blood to Acre Execute there. Finally decides to go for the monkey, the fierce monkey in the end. Pingy Mingo, he picks up the Rock Biter. Initially, is going to be probably the Flame Tongue and just trading with the Totem Golem, but if you can keep that guy healthy, it's pretty valuable. And we might just see a Rock Biter on the Argent Squire as well as a Totem here, which, you know, if you're playing Totem Shaman, every Totem is pretty threatening. Yeah, I think that this change, this would have changed what his play would have been. If he had gotten Spell Power Totem, he would have Spear Claws and traded. Right, right. If he didn't, he was going to Rock Bite our trade, so... Uh, either way, very strong early board. Ravaging Ghoul Execute would ruin this board, but I'm pretty sure Nelio only runs one Ravaging Ghoul. Uh, one Ravaging Ghoul seems to be becoming standard because of how situational the card it is. Right, less zoo these days as well. Yeah, also much less zoo these days. And the zoos that are present, a lot of them are cutting Forbidden Ritual in favor of like Malkasir's Imp um, right. yeah. and some of that package. Good old Disco Lock. Disco Lock? Yeah, because of Karazhan. Discard, oh. discard Lock, Disco Lock. I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's, it's nice. That is cute. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway, <laughs> we have a decision here from Nelio. The thing is, it's somewhat tempting to go with all three of these because there's the Temple of the the Rogue, uh, and then you can go, and it looks like he goes for the Priest in the end here because obviously without the, the armor, it can be problematic, but you can kind of sustain your board over the, the, the Shaman here, and 
Like we, like you mentioned before, the game can go a bit long between these two decks because Shaman just kind of hangs in there the entire time with just resilient threats and things like totems that can get buffed up. So you're sitting there clearing totems, it's kind of hard to just go face without getting punished. So Nelio recognizes that and goes for the long game. I'm not sure if I agree with that play. He's holding on to Blood to Icar Execute for a really long time and... Well, it's turn four, so... Well, for, for, I think for this matchup, it's a really long time. A lot of times, you know, I find myself executing turn two, turn three, if you miss a two drop. There's a lot of things that punish this Frothing Berserker right now. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be, you know, Well, spirit. the board right now it does. So. Well, the board counters it alone because you can make a trades, but Flamestone Totem trades so well with this board. Primal Fusion would trade really well with this board. Uh, even, like, just Totemic Might plus anything. Anything that deals damage would wreck this board. I think that Nilio, he thinks that he can just kind of play for the late game a bit here. The Rogue didn't really do a whole lot. Obviously, the Hunter doesn't really help too much either, especially because he's a bit behind. There's no real, real way he's trading in the near future. Yeah. So he's saying that, like, all right, maybe I can get some value out of here. And the only, if I use Execute early, I just lose to the Flaming Faceless, whereas now I can maybe have a big swing turn later when that does come out. My opponent uses essentially six mana and get countered by two. Yeah. All right, so you know, you'll pretty quick turn this time. Just goes ahead and gets rid of that flame tongue totem here. Four mana for Ping Ping Ho, so can't play out, for instance, you know, Temple Thunderbolt Valiant. But instead, he's gonna go for this mana tide totem and get a pretty nice trade with his spirit claws. And he's looking like he's running away with the board. And having that mana tide means that Nelio not only has to invest into clearing the board, he has to invest into clearing a minion that. Not so really threatening anything for himself. Oh, Alex was a champion. It's probably going to be a good pickup. Next turn, Nilo can really do a lot in com like with Blood to Icar, Execute, and Alex was his champion uh, as a combo. I'm curious whether or not he wanted to use Blood to Icar right now just to fill out his curve, although it does die to Spirit Claws plus Searing Totem. Second Spirit Claws comes in the hand of Ping Ping Ho, which is not really, really one. So it looks like it's going to be a pretty dead turn without picking up the Wrath of Air. Yeah. Double two drop or double one drop, excuse me. Potentially, you shall, <laughs> you shall not pass. Shield bear, shield bear has been a really good card to come off of these maelstrom portals. Actually, and arcane anomaly. These are two of the better ones, I would say. Yeah, definitely two of the better ones. And shield bear is like a stone claw totem with totemic might. Think about that one. Think about that. <laughs> Eat that, haters. Shield bear haters. And Alex Charles' champion is not getting in anytime soon. It can take out three quarters of the shield bear. <laughs> Pretty good. Should look none at shall pass, though. Exactly. Well, three quarters is not the full four quarters, so again, none shall pass. Does it, wait, is that Black Knight? I'm getting confused with these taunts. None shall pass. Yeah. Does he say none shall pass? What does it make really any sense? Well, I know Black Knight says it. it's kind of bizarre. Yeah, Black Knight, I know, says something that's just doesn't really make any sense. So that so would make sense that it doesn't make any sense. Make sense of that. <laughs> I think he's just being ironic. He's there like, actually, all shall pass, but meh. Here. All right, Thunderbolt Valley finally comes down. I'm going to buff two totems, but that's pretty good here for Ping Ping Ho. Against the Stoneclaw totem again, so more walls in front of Nelio here, and likely going to be seeing, finally, the Blood to Icar execute on his side, because that Thunderblood Valley has to go. This is one of the reasons why I don't like being too conservative with uh, Blood to Icar execute early on. Uh, I feel like if you right, try and save it for the Flame Refaceless, and they don't have Flame Refaceless, you're going to lose. Right, I, I know what so you're saying. You might so, as well just go for it early and just lose to Flame Faces anyway. Well, there's the other side of that, right? If you play, if you use it for Temple early, you can maybe get the board and then just naturally deal with Flame Faces. Yeah. Whereas now you're you're falling behind just by the virtue of the fact that you haven't gone for Temple earlier on. I think Nelio might have gotten caught up in the fact that, like, sort of disrespected the deck a little bit and said. Well, the only way you beat me is Flame Refaceless. Right. And so he got That's greedy true. with the, the Blood to Ecker Execute, which in a way you can't blame him, but he held on to it for even a long time after that and just used it now when he could have used it on a Totem Golem early on in the game, That's even after turn four, which, you know, that Totem Golem has now dealt him 
It dealt 13 damage so far. Or I like think that. I think if on turn two he had picked up the blood ticker off the top, he would have pulled the trigger then. But since he had plays to make, he didn't really. It, there's this kind of feeling inside where sure. you always want to curve out. Mm -hmm. You want to play your three drop. You don't really want to play two mana when you just picked it up off the top. So I think he just rationalized in his head like, well, I kind of just want to play off the top here, or I kind of want to just play on curve here, and uh, I can save this blood ticker execute for a bit later. I mean, there's still a chance he just wins because Pinping Ho, his hand is Totemic Might and Spirit Boss. Right. Uh, but... Never Wrath of Air Totem, by the way. Yeah. That Spirit Claws. Drake is not too bad. It, it's reload. That's... Well, good. he could decide to go for the Draconid Crusher anyway, just because it's the only thing that really deals with the massive Totem Golem by itself. Right now, he's staring at... Uh, 9 damage, and it's 11 if the Wrath of Air Totem is rolled, so he needs to kind of take care of himself, but he can just heal his own face here. Finally gonna get rid of the Shield Bearer. That guy has been a nuisance for a long time. Yeah. So, a couple opportunities for lethal here for Pimping Ho. If he picks up any damage and rolls Wrath of Air Totem, Flamer Face is just good now. Yeah. Well, there's a Wrath of Air Totem. Yeah, when you don't pick up lethal, picking up the one of the most dense cards in your deck is a nice consolation prize. Decision making here, whether he wants to start clearing the board. He can get him down to two, speaking of Ping Ping Ho. Yeah. But and yes, he is gonna go ahead and do that. Very difficult for Neo to come back on this board. Execute Ooh. helps quite a bit though. Oh yeah. And curator to follow that up with the fall for the fall turn. Not bad. A uh, Curator is such a great card. One, its stats line for a seven mana that actually draws cards is really good, especially considering it has taunt. Two, this deck runs very low curve beasts and low curve murlocs. If you haven't drawn Finley yet, it'll pull them out of your deck. It'll pull the rest of your fierce monkeys out of the deck. Ooh. What do you think about this? The trades? He didn't care clear the Wrath of Air totem. I think it's fine. Because now he's taking three damage. I guess he would have taken two regardless. There's only two cards left in the deck that even deal damage. He would have, oh, to have he, drawn maybe Rockbiter or Thunderbolt Valiant. But he could have also, I guess, drawn Thalnos or something like that. So he draws Thalnos and gets damage, and he has the Searing Totem. So I guess that's what he was thinking about. Yeah. And he could just roll it again. Right. All right, so it looks like Neo might have actually stabilized after it was getting pretty close to just him falling. You know, a couple draws here for Ping Ping would have won the game, but... Instead, he draw Totemic Might. Exactly. And even Thing from Below is not going to help him all too much. Yeah. So Totemic Might is usually pretty great. I don't want to say that it's a bad card, because I actually preached about this card pretty heavily mm -hmm. when it was when Wicked Witch Doctor was first released. But I feel like the card just can't reach its maximum potential without Wicked Witch Doctor, without a secondary win condition with Bloodlust. Some way to actually utilize your your totems that are now buffed up and a little bit more healthy. And Pimping Ho, the Shaman deck, I, I said earlier on, I didn't like it. I thought it was going to be inconsistent, and that's exactly what it's showing in these first two matchups. Had a huge lead in that game. Got Neelio down all, all the way to uh, to effectively one health with the, with the Spirit Claws. Right. And wasn't able to close out the game because he had so many dead draws in the later half. Even getting... In the last four draws, a thing, or sorry, a flaming faceless wasn't enough because Nelio was able to answer it with this execute, and those totemic mites just not really doing much. Yeah, I can't help but agree with you there. And even the flaming faceless, if that was something like a wicked witch doctor, played all of his spells, had a bunch of totems, then goes totemic might, mm. then you're looking at the board and you have Thunderbolt Valiant to finish off the game. Mm. You just need either one or the other. If it's too much, of, you know, mixed cards, mixed yeah. energies, then it can just fall flat like that. Like family faces by itself, just didn't do enough. Didn't do enough. So Nelio, uh, I, I believe he has mid shaman left. Uh, if I had to take a guess, Pippinko would ban Malagos Druid. Mm -hmm. um, Druid really strong right now. A lot of players think that Malagos Druid is one of the best decks in the game. But mid shaman is scary. The one thing I that I think about Pippinko, though, is he, he, he's very confident in playing Shaman and playing against Shaman. Right, because he knows every, all the ins and outs of how, you know, the strategies that go into winning certain games. He even knew then, with his opponent at 6 health, he's like, well, I'm just not going to win this game. Time to concede. <laughs> not going to win. Well, he had, he, had, <laughs> he had, like, no damage left in his yeah, deck. Yeah, exactly. And his board was just getting cleared every turn. He had to get to a Curator. So, so really big deal, though, because... 
If we consider that his weakest deck right now, getting that out of the way would really go far and allow him to win this match. But instead, now he still has to win with it. And it looks like we do have... Yes, he banned Shaman away from Elio. Huh. So Druid's going to be the last deck from, from Elio. That's right. really interesting that he... Maybe he just respects Midrange Challenge so much that he wanted to take it away. <laughs> He's like, Shaman's too strong. Yeah, Can't but deal with I it. feel like his decks are really good against Shaman. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think that Ping Ping Ho might be just going down with a Shaman 3 0 right now. It's a possibility. Uh, Malagos Druid can sometimes struggle against Shaman uh, because they don't have really good answers to their early board. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't deal with wide boards really well unless they get like really situational Raven Idol stuff or like really early spell power swipes, things like that. Right. Um, against this matchup, you sort of have to use the spells that you would otherwise use for Malagos combo really early on in the game and just hope you draw into Arcane Giants or some way to reload. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you have to use like Moonfires without Violet Teacher Synergies or anything like that just to clear up board and stop taking damage. So, with the flaming faces in the deck w instead of the witch doctor, do you think maybe he was targeting Druid? We could take a look at his decks in a second here, but just thinking about it, for Druid, they can't deal with wide and big boards at the same time, right? They can't deal, yeah. they, they have the mulches, which is usually one in the deck unless they get Raven Idol. They can't deal with wide boards unless they commit, you know, several cards. And uh, sometimes to deal with the wide board, you just make your own wide board, but you can't do that, obviously, if you're facing, you know, a big threat on turn four. So, it's, uh, what do you think? It's possible, but I don't feel like the Beast Druid fits in there very well. Right. If you're going for a situation where you want to um, counter Druid. I also don't think Totem Shaman fits in that really well. You might as well just bring Agar Shaman. But we'll give I think, we'll give Pimping Hill a pass here just mm -hmm. because of the fact that Pimping Hill won't play Agar Shaman. Right. <laughs> he doesn't think it's really Shaman. <laughs> yeah, it's not the real Shaman. Just a bunch of face cards. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that Agar Shaman... It's a pretty even matchup against Druid, I would say. Well, this is a no Ancient of War version. Right. So And no Moonglade Portal. So it's really hard for you to sta stabilize as this deck. All right, well, here we go. Potentially the final match, or the final game of this match. Uh, Nelio up 2-0 in the series. That's Malfurion. That is Malfurion and another Malfurion. I think we heard a, a glimpse of Emperor Thorson, but in any case, we're going to see... This matchup, not really a mirror matchup, in fact, pretty far from a mirror matchup as you can get, uh, you know, considering that they're both Malfurion here. Uh. going to be Beast versus Malagos. Bunch of uh, big mid-range minions hitting your face versus a lot of spell damage at the end here for Nilio. So, Pimping Ho, uh, passing this early as B-Shoot is not what you want to yeah, do. not at all. Even turn one, you want to get that Raven Idol, or not the Raven Idol, excuse me, the uh, Enchanted Raven, or the Living is potentially out there. Mm -hmm. And Nilio, he realizes that this is Beast Druid, and he's thinking, do I need to get out this Power of the Wild out on the board as quickly as possible? I can't really wait for some sort of crazy board later, because I'm likely going to be trying to remove my opponent's board every single turn from here on out. Yeah, I really like this play. It's not something that a lot of players will immediately go for because they just look at Power of the Wild and they think of it as Violet Teacher Synergy. Uh, but now Anelia will have a way to uh, deal with this Druid of the Flame. And I think it's going to be Innervate Azure plus Moonfire. Yep, Moonfire, good card sometimes in situations like these. He's going to go ahead and take that out nice and easy. And goodbye, Druid of the Flame. No Mark of Yashirash for you. No Wild Walker as well. And Nilio gets something on the board to contest whatever the next threat that Pimping Hill is going to play. And this is what I talked about with Wild Walker. Just, it, it, you'd much rather have something that's proactive. I mean, look at his hand. He doesn't even have a beast. And he's got four beast synergy cards. That said, <laughs> that said, double mark of Yashiraj and Wild Walker. It, every single deck can run into this issue where he's like, I put two in this deck in order to draw one, not to draw both of them. Yeah. All right, decision time here for Nilio. It's most likely going to be going to be between the Nourish and the Feral Rage here, and uh, his hand is looking pretty anemic. But he does have the cycle with that Thalnos. On the other hand, the Feral Rage is a really good tool for either removal or to get that health back, which he's going to be taking a pounding most likely in the mid game here. So I don't know, pretty tough decision here. What would you take? I'd probably take Nourish. Feral Rage, uh, you would take if you wanted to line up for a threat the following turn. But there's not really anything that Pimping Hill is going to play on turn five that's going to be killed 
fully by a Feral Rage, whether it be Stranglethorn Tiger, even Mounted Raptor, the second body wouldn't be able to be killed, so it's a little bit awkward. This is... I'm not like this thing over here, uh, <laughs> TJ, because he has three. He has four beast, kind of like, you know, they, they work with beasts. They have beast synergy. Four but mana, four force, not good. Yeah. <laughs> two. It's not. He has four cards in his hand that deal, that have synergy with beasts, but no beasts in his hand. And now that he's used a swipe, Nelio can just feel free to wow. go pretty ham with Spot Teacher and picks up Power of the Wild. And he's going to get another 1-1 one, one for his troubles. He went for the card there rather than clearing it off right away. And going to get pretty rewarded because Ping Ping has no way to deal with this. Neo Yo kind of wins. He's like, I wish I had that Innervate, but he's going to be pretty happy unless Ping Ping Ho top deck swipe right now. Nope, that's not going to be the case. And yep, Neo Yo seems to be running away with this game. That is really good, though, because he could go Stranglethorn Tiger next. Okay, <laughs> I'll explain to the viewers. It's going to be Stranglethorn Tiger, Innervate into the Mark of Yashiraj, followed by the Menagerie Warden next turn to get double 7-7 seven, seven stealth on the following turn as TJ dies in a coughing fit. But uh, I'm back. All right. Wondering I, couldn't, if I couldn't hold back the cough. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> Mark of Yashiraj, yeah, you, yeah. you said it. Yep. Uh, just interesting to see if he goes for it right now. He can just go for it next turn. It's not really necessary. Um, just kind of... Wondering whether he might want to have one mana next turn. He could, if he goes for the Innervate into Mark Yashiraj right now, he can play Enchanted Raven potentially with Menagerie Warden. So that's, or he could actually just Innervate Molt right now, but then he can't Innervate next turn. So yeah. yeah. I think just passing here is pretty good. And <laughs> Swipe Face Power of the Wild. <laughs> swipe Face Power of the Wild. No, 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 no. Be yeah. I huh. Oh, he's going for, for mana and right. Power of the Wild. Right, because he has Drake in hand, yeah, for. for yeah. yeah, so it gets an extra 2-2 for the Nourish, and so it's not a complete waste of a card here. And he gets the extra mana for the Drake, and everything's looking pretty good here for Nelio right now. Yeah, I don't know what Pimping Ho is going to be able to do. Uh, Nelio realized that he just wants to be able to play whatever he draws. He doesn't really need cards. He has what he, ha he, has what he needs to sort of win the game. Uh, Drew to the Claw could be pretty impactful, but not really. Just put I up a huge wall. <laughs> just put up a, what would that be, a 6-8? Uh, sorry, an 8-10 taunt. Yeah. Drew the Claw, Marker Rush Rush, Innervate, Marker Rush Rush. He doesn't need to clear off the Vile Teacher, unfortunately, I so think it might just be a 6-8 yeah, here. I think you just need to make the strongest possible board you could this turn, and that would mean Marker Rush Rush into um, Menagerie Warden. I mean, there, there is some merit into playing Drew to the Claw and Innervating out Marker Rush Rush to make that 6-8 like you talked about. He is dead, we do know that if he does decide to go ahead and Menagerie Warden right now and kill off the Violet Teacher, there is 12 damage on board plus mm. 5 in hand. So so maybe the taunt is good because the 2-2s line up quite nicely into that. Oh, well, he's dead. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, this play makes sense because yeah. if he lives this turn, then he's in a great position because yeah. he can clear off the board and then Drew to the Claw into it. Well, there's Malkos. Yeah. But, yeah, I definitely do agree with you. You go for the... the the play that wins you the game, not the play that you know sur yeah. you survive for this particular turn. If you yeah. get past this turn, you're in fantastic shape later on. But that's the breaks. Nilio is going to go ahead and have exact lethal here. Going to finish out this series, and he is going to move on while Ping Ping Ho moves down to the lower bracket. Yeah, and I don't know. I, I'm not liking Ping Ping Ho's chances moving forward in this tournament based off of how his decks performed in this series. Nilio brought decks that I can imagine a lot of the field will bring. Uh, very similar styles with just Dragon Warrior, Malagos Druid, some kind of Shaman, whether it be mid or aggro, <coughs> and some kind of Mage. Right. Well, Neo did perform very well. We don't know if every single player will perform as well as Neo did here. Maybe one decision that we somewhat disagreed with as far as the Blood to Icar execute. But besides that, pretty flawless play from here from Neo. He still won. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if I necessarily disagreed with it. I was trying to think if I did. Um, he held off going to turn four, so you know exactly what his plan was, and that was to have an answer to the Flame Rate Faceless should Pimping Hill play it. But who knows if, you know, that's going to give you a higher win rate overall and right. the, and the, over the course of the game. Uh, but definitely well played by Nelio, and liking his decks, I, I said earlier I predicted him to win based off his performance, based off watching him for a few years play now. Yeah, first round, first pick <laughs> yeah. in our little draft, but... Uh, yeah, I have to definitely have to agree. I'm liking the pick by you. And like liking the play by Nelio, looking like one of the favorites, certainly, if just based on that match. 3-0 over a very strong player in Ping Ping House. So I'm looking forward to see if Nelio can maybe go far and take the tournament. 
Yeah, Pipico definitely going to have to uh, go back to the... The drawing board. Except he does, has to stay with the same decks. But yeah, go back to the drawing board as far as like his general strategy with these decks go, though. Right. Um, you know, maybe playing a little bit more, trying to theme his deck a little bit more aggressively and going all in a little bit quicker with the Shaman. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Nelio, you know, just keep doing the same thing. It's going to be a long road for Pimpingo falling down the, to the lower bracket in the first round. Means he, in order to get to the top eight, he's going to have to win like eight in a row. Right. It's There's a lot a lot of extra matches because you play against the people who end up drawing dropping down later, whereas mm -hmm. you know you don't have those extra matches if you stay in the winner's bracket. So definitely a really unenviable spot to fall down right in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but definitely a, a, a fun first match, and uh, we do have uh, plenty more to go uh, throughout the day today. Uh, if you guys get a chance, make sure you uh, head on Twitter. Uh, you can hit up me or D2. You can also uh, tweet at HearthSEA um, uh, with the, I believe the hashtag is Hearth, Hearth SEA, SEA Major. Major. Hearth SEA Major. Uh, if you guys want to join in on some of the conversations, let us know what you think of the matches and let us know uh, how you're enjoying them throughout the day. Uh, but like we said, plenty more matches to come. We are going to have to go to a little bit of a break before we jump into the next match of the day. Uh, but don't go anywhere, guys. More Thailand Hearthstone Major will continue right after this.